Eric Archer here with TI, and today's Smart Space video lesson with uh, Jessica Kahoot is going to cover biodiversity, so differences in organisms and, and, and the tools we can use to find those differences. So Jessica is going to take us through how to do that. Jessica. Hi. Yes, I'm very excited to share with you um, this activity um, on biodiversity. And we're going to be looking at a very special organism, um, which are benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, and so benthic, benthic macroinvertebrates, if you don't know, they're, well, benthic, meaning that they live on the ground, but in water, aquatic water. Um, and macroinvertebrates, we can see with the naked eye, so we don't need a microscope. We can, sometimes we'll use um, magnifying glasses um, but they can be very small, but, but not small enough that we can't see them um, without just looking at them. And they're invertebrates. Hey Jessica, meaning, yes. Sorry, something tells me, are these your pictures? Did you take these pictures? Yes, these are my pictures. So you caught these little critters. Yes, we did. And I'll show you exactly how we did that. Um, and we take our students out to catch these. Um, it's a ninth grade experience and it's super fun. The kids love it. They initially, some of the kids go out there thinking, I do not want to do this. I do not want to touch these. And they get out there and they're the ones like waist deep in water if possible, like just all in. It's amazing. It's really that fun. <laughs> And they're, they're actually really important organisms because these benthic macroinvertebrates are bioindicators of the health of local streams. So we look at our local streams and they tell a story about how healthy they are. So if we are able to catch and identify these benthic macroinvertebrates, we have an understanding of the water quality as well. And so there's, there's a lot to them other than just being fun to catch and interesting to look at. And so our students are part of this thing called the Watershed Report Card in our district. Um, and all ninth graders participate in it. It's considered a meaningful watershed educational experience or MIWI. Um, and it gets, it's part of our state um, environmental literacy graduation requirement where students collect, analyze data, and then they communicate that data um, to local um, policymakers. Um, and try to make an authentic change in their own neighborhoods. Um, and it's a really great experience for everybody involved, including the teachers. Um, we partner with the Howard County Conservancy in our district, we're in Howard County, Maryland, and they've helped us provide some resources. They've had funding through NOAA and worked with the department or the um, Maryland Department of Natural Resources in order to get help with all of this um, Activity. And we create a report card. Um, and the last report card I have here. Um, and so we had a C plus last year in terms of our health of our stream in Howard County. Um, and so these students that we work with get a chance to really contribute back to their own communities with a project like this. Um, and so with this project, we collect lots of data. Um, and so we look at both abiotic and biotic factors. So with the abiotic factors, which are the non-living factors, um, we look at the hydrosphere as far as the forest canopy and the sky conditions on that specific day. The stream corridor assessment, we look for erosion um, and just the, whether there's lots of um, or cover in terms of what kind of plants are nearby. Um, the water quality assessment, we take lots of data in, um, encompassing dissolved oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, pH, temperature, turbidity, and conductivity. And that gives us an idea of what is in the water. Um, but then we also look at the biotic part. We look at the animals living in the water and that tells a piece of the story too. And so that's the part that we're gonna focus on in terms of biodiversity. Because if those benthic macroinvertebrates are there, certain types tell us how healthy the stream is going to be. And so just to give you an idea of where I am, um, I'm in Maryland. And Maryland is part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so within Maryland, we are in Howard County, which is kind of centrally located right here. 
Um, and then our stream is um, in this little area in King's Contrivance. It's between two high schools. So my high school, which is Reservoir High School, another high school, Hammond High School, collect from the same stream. Um, and so we also pull data as well. So we get multiple recordings of that stream over several days or the same day, depending on how the field trips are able to be scheduled. <laughs> um, and then this year, um, this year's a bit different um, because we can't take field trips this fall. And so we collected some data already this summer. Um, and so these are pictures of my own children <laughs> that are out there collecting samples. So we're using D-nets to kind of get those benthic macroinvertebrates stirred up so we can collect them in the nets and scoop them up. And then from those nets where um, we then put them in yogurt containers or ice cube trays to identify them. And so by looking at what might be hidden under those rocks or the, in those riffles of that stream, we can kind of get a little snapshot of how healthy it is along with all the other data that we're collecting. And so in order, once we collect those organisms, we need to figure out what they are. Um, and so we use something called a dichotomous key. And so the Maryland Department of Natural Resources helped us create this key um, to help us figure out what these critters were. Because as the students are collecting these, these benthic macroinvertebrates, it's kind of sometimes hard to determine what it is since they don't normally see them on a daily basis. Um, and so exposing students to this type of data collection is very interesting and they really enjoy it um, and try to figure out and find the most unique ones and the craziest ones. Um, the dragonfly larvae are always really fun. Um, they're very different than what a dragonfly actually looks like. Um, and helgramites are another kind of fun one. Um, it's bitten someone, not a student luckily, a volunteer, where it actually drew blood. Um, so <laughs> there's some really crazy things. Yeah. Um, but these, these give us an indication of healthy streams because if these organisms can survive, it tells us that there are conditions that help them survive well. So they've got enough nutrients, the right amount of nutrients, um, there's oxygen, um, the temperature's right, so it gives us a lot of information about the stream. So these are some samples of pictures um, of those benthic macroinvertebrates that we've collected this summer, just a few weeks ago, um, and you can see some of them are very tiny. There's some pennies that are in here to kind of show you the scale in which the organisms are. We caught a crayfish as well. That's always a fun thing to catch and find. Um, and so once we collect them, again, we sort them in those yogurt containers or um, ice cube trays, and then the fun begins with using that dichotomous key. So here is a picture up in the corner of an organism, and I want to see if you can identify that using the dichotomous key. Do you remember how to use a dichotomous key, Eric? Yeah, I, th I think I'll, I can give it a try. So where would you start? Well, it started at the top. And okay. uh, it looks like the first thing we ask is if the organism has legs. Yes. Okay. And does our organism have legs? Yeah. So it does it has legs and I go down a level. Right. And now it's the number of legs. It looks like I have a choice between 10 legs, 10 plus legs, meaning 10 or more legs, or three pairs of legs. And it looks like this little critter in the picture has three pairs of legs. So then I'm going to come down, and the next decision I have to make is the number uh, of tails. So either it's no obvious tail, two tails, or three tails. And it looks like this, this little critter has three separate tails coming off of its, its rear. <laughs> um, and so if I follow that, it looks like I'm either, I'm either a damselfly or a mayfly. And from the picture, it looks like this critter is closer to a three-tailed mayfly. Is that yeah, right? It is correct. And it's hard to see here, but it says paddle-like tails, no gills along abdomen. And this says thread-like tails, gills along abdomen. And you can oh, really yeah. 
see the gills really clearly on this particular mayfly. That's um, wild. Yeah, and the, the tails are really cool too. Yeah. This is a really cool find. I don't <laughs> really know if, if, I, if I'm excited about how creepy this thing looks or how cool it looks. It's kind of a in between for me. I think it's both. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and here's another one. Let's see if you can figure this one out. Oh my goodness. All right. So legs, yes. Uh, three pairs of legs, uh, yes. I don't see a tail uh, on this thing. And so it's got to be on the bottom of that chart. Uh, it could be a riffle beetle, um, although I don't see antennae on the front of that one. Uh, but the close. Yeah kind of hard to see but yeah, yeah. it's a whistle beetle, um, beetle. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah so the, it's also very small so the antenna wouldn't be able to i guess we can't really see that very well but that is a riffle beetle so two That's for cool. two yeah right. yes <laughs> all right one more oh wow that's weird looking okay all right so let's see i uh let's see it has I can't tell if it has legs or not. Is this thing, it looks like it probably does underneath. Nope, no legs. No legs, okay, so no legs. So we're going up. All right, um, can't really tell. Let's see if it has a shell. Uh, it does have a shell. Okay, so shell, and then I come down to single or double. Um, and it looks like it has, hard to see in the picture, but I think it has a single shell. It does. All right. And man, oh man. Okay, so this is a snail. And mm -hmm. looks like the closest looks like I'm I'm stuck on this one. I can't tell if it has the little pointy thing, uh the spiral open on the right or the spiral with opening on the left. I can't see that. Yeah, wow. this is actually a lunged snail. So it's on the oh. left. Yeah, right. this was a hard one. You did yeah. very well with it. <laughs> well, I, I see the penny in the window, like the, the pennies in the picture, and so this thing would be super small. Right, and you know, collecting those in the nets, and then we use um, paint brushes, little tiny paint brushes, to kind of work through all the sediment that gets also collected in the net to find these critters. Um, and so it's very exciting when we do. Um, so once we collect all the organisms, we have this data chart that we place them in. And so those organisms will have, um, tell us different stories. Um, some are more sensitive to pollution, um, like that mayfly is very sensitive to pollution, so we're very excited to see it um, because it means that the stream is, is in good condition. Um, we have less sensitive pollution, somewhat tolerant, and then tolerant to pollution. And so from this information, we collect it, um, and then it, we kind of use that to give it a scale in terms of, is it a good, fair, moderate, or very poor in terms of our overall health of the stream. Um, and so this is example of the data we collected this summer, um, just a few weeks ago. And um, so here is the data collection we did. We've got some crayfish mayflies and so forth. These are the numbers that we found and some additional things that are on here, like a whirly gig, which is these little fast critters that just kind of swam really fast. We did find um, a fish. Um, we're not quite sure which one it was. We didn't have any identifying fish dichotomous keys with us. Um, and that really cool brush leg mayfly. So that was really neat. Our data for 2020 is a little bit off because again, we took it in the summer. We normally take the data in the fall. And we also normally put out leaf packs which is like we take onion bags and stuff them full of leaves by the stream and then put them in the stream for about six weeks to create a little habitat to get some of those benthic macroinvertebrates living in it. And then we collect those stream, um, leaf packs and then go through it with our um, paint brushes and separate that. So the quantity of the data or quantity of the benthic macroinvertebrates is a little bit lower than we have in the past just because of the current situation we're in and the access we have. Um, but again, it's just a snapshot of the overall health. So we also take that abiotic factors of the water quality. Here's, this is a picture of me taking the conductivity of the stream. Um, and generally this year, it is fairly decent. Um, and this is our last year stream assessment. Um, this is showing um, both the abiotic and biotic. So we had a little bit 
larger numbers. Um, and so our, our, you're fair instead of, I think we're what, very poor fair <laughs> this year. Um, but I think that's just due to the number of samples that we collected, which just gives us another talk topic with students is sample size matters. And the lower you have a sample size, you're gonna have a, your data is gonna be a little bit off. And this is real data that the students collect and make sense of. And having conversations about well, what, how the sample size affect your results is very important. Um, and then what I want to do next is I have, um, I show my students how to graph that data to give them a visual representation. So I have here a list and spreadsheet of sensitive, less sensitive, somewhat um, tolerant, and tolerant. And then those values of organisms that we got from 2020, 2019, and 2018. Um, in 2018, there's, we had a lot of different, or I guess our field trips were on different days. So that's why we have some decimal points. We averaged out our data from Hammond High School and Reservoir High School as well. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add um, a document. I'm gonna add a data and statistics page. And then on our x-axis, I'm gonna add our macro invertebrate categories. So from less, less sensitive to tolerant. Um, and then I'm going to add a summary list from 2020 so that we can get a visual representation of how our macroinvertebrates um, are telling us how the stream is. And in this particular small snapshot of this one particular day, less sensitive was the highest. Um, and so we're in good shape. But then we can also um, add 2019 to this list to kind of see how it changes as well as 2018. So we can look at some visual rep representations of how these organisms have fluctuated over the years and just kind of tell the story of the stream of how these living organisms are faring based off of the human impact of what we're doing around this area. Um, so it's a great way for students to visualize what's happening, where we are, and where we kind of think about ideas of where we want to be. Um, so yeah. What do you think about macroinvertebrates now? Yeah, uh, still kind of creepy, but uh, <laughs> I love how you, 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 you and the students use them as a sort of an indication of the health of the, uh, the aquatic ecosystem, the stream itself, um, in addition to the abiotic factors, which you also, also measured um, with different instruments and things like that. So, and then having three years of data kind of gives you a better idea of how are we doing? You know, are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Um, but I think my favorite part of, out of all of it was the, uh, the dichotomous key using a bunch of yes, no questions to try to identify those, those little, those little critters, which like I said, I'm fascinated by it, but I'm also kind of, you know, creeped out by them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fun. You should definitely go out in the stream one day and find some critters. <laughs> well, now I don't want to go into the stream. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great, Jessica. Thank you for this this uh, video and this lesson, and, and kind of showing us how you know you're using biodiversity as a way to understand the health of a system. So it's not just um, understanding, hey, there's biodiversity. It's saying, okay, we know there's biodiversity, but we need to. There needs to be a, a the better, the more biodiversity, the better for the health of the ecosystem. And so I, I, I love that. I think that was fantastic. All right. Well, thank you. It was fun. Thank you.